address some of the very important issues related to power and democracy, uh, especially from two perspectives, uh, one within the whole framework of the nation state, um, looking at the issues of representative democracy, its crisis of legitimacy and increasing fascist tendencies. And the second very grounded radical uh, democracy and direct democracy practices uh, that are challenging the state and emerging from the ground. And what kind of uh, radical transformations and frameworks are emerging. So to facilitate today's discussion, we have Ashish Kothari. Um, he's a well-known environment activist, a member of an environment action group, Bagbavich in India. Uh, helps in coordinating alternatives confluence process with Alp Sangam in India and also part of the global tapestry of alternatives. Um, Ashish, over to you. Just a request to all the speakers uh, to be slow so that the interpretations uh, can happen smoothly. Thank you. Thank you, Srishti. Um, before I start, uh, we had a request if somebody could help translate from Portuguese and Spanish into English in the chat box for Sherwin, one of our panelists, whose interpretation room is not working. So if any of you can just put main points spoken in Portuguese or Spanish into English in the chat, that would be very useful. Thank you. Um, so the, the topic today, power and democracy, despair and hope. Uh, I think all of us are seeing across the world, wherever we are, a very serious crisis of legitimacy of democracy as we've known it in the recent times. We're seeing uh, both in countries and at the level of the global international organizations such as the UN, that we've had a history of both some positive measures that nation states and the United Nations systems can take in terms of welfare, human rights, and so on, but also significant failures to deal with fundamental issues like inequality, climate crisis, the biodiversity crisis, uh, regulating the completely unregulated uh, imperialism or hegemonies of many powers, and so on. We have also seen in the last few decades, especially, how economic globalization has created enormous insecurity and vulnerability, not just amongst those who were already on the margins, but even those who considered themselves to be somewhat part of the uh, benefited classes or the privileged classes, such that only maybe one to five percent of the world is today seemingly secure in terms of livelihoods and many other aspects of life, including psychological. Um, now, the kind of responses to this kind of marginalization or the creation of what some people are calling the precariat, which is precarious ways of living, which have especially got highlighted during the COVID pandemic. Um, are there, I think there are three kinds of responses and this panel will hopefully help us to go deeper into these and the relationship amongst them. One kind is the demand to reinstate uh, the welfare and the rights guaranteeing role of the nation state. And so sometimes, for instance, when we see a shift, which is a very, very relative shift from say Trump to Biden, people heave a sigh of relief because they feel that there will be at least some more welfare measures, some more of the state to help guarantee rights. Uh, the second kind of response is uh, unfortunately common, which is to bring in authoritarian parties, especially strong men who people feel will be able to set society right. And the third, which is possibly the most hopeful one, is where people are trying to claim or reclaim power on the ground, take back control over their lives in collective ways in various different ways of expressing uh, deliberative radical democracy on the ground. In all of these, the very crucial questions of power and democracy, the notions of power, 
for instance is it power over that is the power to dominate or can we think of power with and power to in which all of us it's not a zero sum game in which in fact we use all of our inherent powers to uh, for emancipation um the crisis uh, the the question with regard to the role of the state is also something that has uh, been thrown up in all of these uh, events and discussions in the last few decades in the last few years especially is there a legitimate role for the state what would be that role if at all so uh, some of the most exciting things that are actually happening on the ground and some of our panelists represent those movements are the ones where communities collectives in villages in cities are claiming power as i mentioned earlier you can have examples like a a bunch of villages in central india claiming that where they are in their villages they are the government and they will be taking all the decisions and also making those who are sitting in new delhi uh, in the so called corridors of power making them accountable or we can have much larger uh visions and practices of radical democracy such as the zapatista and the one that sherveen on our panel represents today the kurdish rojava movement uh the combination of feminist anti patriarchal anti racist uh and radical democratic movements and of course ecological movements in many parts of the world the movements for indigenous self determination in latin america in canada and australia in parts of africa um the movements for citizens assemblies in cities trying to claim or reclaim the right to govern and manage uh, cities um all of these provide very important lessons and clues to us on how we can in a sense challenge the kind of capitalist or statist domination of our lives which has uh, been allowed to happen in liberal democracies maybe liberal democracy is kind of even oriented towards that uh, challenge the very central role of the, of the state and of the capitalist corporation um and but also lessons on how do we then organize ourselves on the ground how do we deal with issues of social injustice which can sometimes get even increase when there's a uh, local radical democracy if there isn't a simultaneous movement for uh social justice equality and so on and a very crucial question how do we look at current nation state political boundaries many of which are accidents of history many of which are results of colonialism if you look at the way africa was divided up into countries for instance or some parts of south asia um can we go beyond that can we look at for instance ecological contiguity and cultural contiguity and relations and think of eco regions and bio regions beyond the nation state boundaries so these are all very crucial questions that have come up in uh, as i said in the last few decades and especially the last few years and we are hoping that this very exciting panel that we have today with us will help us to go deeper into understanding if not necessarily answering all these questions uh the way we are going to do it is not long speeches I will be posing two sets of questions to each of the panelists and uh, they'll get a certain amount of time to respond to them and we hope that we'll finish all of this in about an hour so that we have at least an hour left for an open discussion with the rest of you as participants. So let me start and I will introduce each of them as I ask the first question. Let's start with uh, Kali. Kali Akuno has been at the center of the anti racist movement in the united states um but is also very well known to be an organizer of the cooperative movement of trying to bring back control over the economy into the local community especially marginalized local communities he is the co-founder of a very interesting initiative called cooperation jackson which attempts to Uh, advocate and practice these things is also the co-director of the US human rights network and has for a long time played this very interesting interface between uh, cooperative economics politics and social justice so kali let me start with you and ask you very quickly maybe just in 2 or 3 minutes if you can 
say something further about your, the relationship of your work with the topic of today, especially with radical democracy and, and the state? No problem, no problem. Uh, first off, um, good morning to many, good day. Uh, some of you in other areas, uh, pleasure to be here. Uh, in the short amount of time that I have, um, I would say, I mean, our, our project has been more, much more focused in the long term around transforming society and democratizing society through the institution of, of people's assemblies. Um, and these assemblies are attempts at local grassroots direct democracy. Uh, and self-governance. And for us, that means kind of two things uh, relative to our work. One, there is kind of a consistent relationship of either trying to contain the state or to make certain demands of it, uh, particularly for it to fulfill its role in kind of being a guarantor of rights. But then there's another component of it, which is trying to organize our communities so that they do not only acts of kind of self-governance, but self-administration of actually putting their ideas directly into practice and executing them through their own resources. Um, and so that is the critical kind of dual component of the People's Assembly work that we've been working at constructing here uh, in Jackson for now well over almost uh, close to almost two decades uh, with some of the antecedents of that going back even further to, to uh, almost 40 uh, years now. Uh, and we've very consciously and deliberately tried to intervene uh, in the state and to try to transform it on a local municipal level um, and try to get it to a uh, curtail many of its kind of repressive functions, um, the police in particular uh, and what they do in our communities, how they can find and constrain and attack our communities, uh, but to also to open up certain avenues so that the, the social movements can take more of a direct role in kind of administering um, economic affairs or in doing conflict mediation within our communities. So these are some critical pieces that cooperation Jackson and the broader kind of social democratic movement in, the, in, in Jackson, Mississippi have been there for quite some time. Thanks, Kali, and I'm going to come back to you in the next round on specifically the issues of uh, power, um, how you look at power and, uh, you know, how that's emerged in the activism that you've done. Fascinating. Thank you. Uh, I'm going to go to Ruth now. Ruth uh, Nayambura is a Kenyan uh, feminist. She is, uh, I think, one of the founders of the African Eco-Feminist Collective. She's a researcher. She's an organizer. She's especially been focusing on agrarian political economy and political ecology. Um, Ruth, over to you, the same question. How does your work relate to the topic of today in two or three minutes? Thank you so much. So I will basically center my response to the work of the African Ecofeminist Collective, which is a transnational African uh, feminist collective of um, organizers, researchers who work on the intersections of ecological justice, challenging patriarchy, challenging homophobia, challenging uh, the ecological destruction that we see, but also uh, moving through a politics of regeneration. And I'd say that for us as an African ecofeminist collective, our central point in terms of addressing the state has been um, thinking through political education. And I say this is absolutely important for us because we live in a continent where, and of course this is not particular to the continent of Africa, but everything we see in terms of a politics of ecology, majority of it comes in the form of NGization, you know, capacity building projects, you know, very depoliticized uh, capacity building projects, education systems. Uh, Ruth, Ruth yes? sorry to interrupt. A little slower, please, for the interpreters. All right, all right. Um, okay. So, um, Basically, the African Ecofeminist Collective has been working through a politics of political education. Uh, we're working in terms of resourcing movements for the kind of liberatory work um, that we need to see. So we come 
from a context of enjoyization of uh, the, the kind of work that we do, capacity building projects that, you know, really championed in the form of NGO, depoliticized NGO work, you know, coming from, you know, depoliticized educational systems, uh, living through the afterlives of colonization, uh, neoliberalism, you know, the rolling back of the state. And so for us, for the Ecofeminist Collective, radical feminist political education and also popular education has been very central for us, you know, in terms of resourcing movements to first of all understand the structure um, of the state, to understand the long histories of the state, to understand the long histories of colonization, and for us to be able to understand how we find ourselves in an ecological crisis and what that means to us, right? Um, including what is being pushed for, forward in terms of the techno fixes, the false solutions to the climate crisis that continue to center so-called solutions within um, you know, the market, rather than you know, a radical shift from the kind of economic structures and political structures that we find ourselves in. So that has been very central for us. And you know, it has focused on unpacking the grand narratives of power, right, in multiple um, arenas, you know, becoming fluent in each other's histories, the intergenerational histories uh, across this continent, not just intergeneration, but also, you know, the transnational histories of this uh, continent, also dialogues across difference uh, and power, of course, right, and also thinking through a politics of regenerative politics, you know, how do we think about regeneration, a politics of life, a politics of health, a politics of healing and joy, celebration, rest, tenderness, and of course, a politics of the commons. So this is how the Ecofeminist Collective that I'm part of is thinking through questions of power, questions of the state, and how to radically transform um, ourselves, our communities, and the societies that we find ourselves in. Thanks, Ruth, uh, and uh, I will also be coming back to you on, especially on that last part that you just said, so that we can elaborate that uh, further in the next round. Uh, let's go to Sherwin uh, Nudem. Um, Sherwin is uh, currently in and part of the Kurdish uh, women's liberation movement in the Rojava area of that extremely conflict-ridden zone where they're trying, they've been trying to create a a zone of eco-feminist radical democracy peace is quite a remarkable to me not that i've been there but from afar it looks like one of the most uh, inspiring uh, large-scale movements in the world um Sherwin is with the genealogy academy the genealogy spelled here is j-i-n-e-o-l-o-j-i which is the uh, local version of uh, eco-feminist ideology maybe she can explain that later um, she has been very much into popular education, into community-based research on the history and the dynamics of the women's revolution and of the democratic autonomy movement in, in that region. Sherwin, um, over to you. Can you tell us a little bit about how your work relates to today's topic, briefly? I will try to make it briefly. At first, many greetings of solidarity from the Genealogy Academy in Rojava. Um, I don't know how much uh, you know about the situation here and about uh, the building up process of dem uh, democratic autonomy. Um, but I think it's important to emphasize that it's not a zone that we try to create, but we have been involved in the process of building up um, a self-organization in society uh, which is based uh, on the pillars of radical democracy, ecology and gender liberation. So actually the system of people's assemblies of popular ed education uh, that also the other two friends were mentioning are also a part of this process here. And um, actually in Rojava uh, we see which is the name of West Kurdistan as Kurdistan was divided uh, through colonial um, occupation of the Middle East in, in four parts and the establishment of a uh, nation state. These dividing borders, uh, we want to lift uh, among the people. We want to make them meaningless and um, to connect uh, the building up processes as well as our struggles um, for a just and uh, world. Um, and it's... Um, yeah, we can really see how much uh, destruction has been uh, created uh, by uh, nation state ideology um, and borders, um, which if 
how it uh, has uh, divided families, uh, uh, put them on different parts of the borders, how it has destroyed com uh, communities. And this process is going on until today. Um, and we really clearly saw also, especially with the last occupation uh, attacks of the Turkish state on the town of Afrin, uh, on Serekani, on Girisipi, um, which were carried out in front of the eyes of the public and were against all international laws and uh, UN conventions, but still the state of occupation on Afrin on Serekani, on different region uh, is continuing. Uh, hundreds of thousands of people have been displaced. But in spite of this, um, we are continuing with the, um, con uh, with the process of um, building up uh, 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 alternatives uh, in society. Uh, maybe shortly um, about uh, what are concretely our works uh, as genealogy. Uh, genealogy means uh, science of women, life and society. And it has been developed in the context of the women's liberation struggle in Kurdistan. Uh, and our approach has always been uh, a women's liberation cannot be postponed after the revolution. And more than this, uh, it is uh, autonomous women's organizing uh, is actually the foundation of radical democratic changes in society. And it is also the basis for fighting patriarchy, colonialism, capitalism, uh, state powers and all forms uh, of oppression. So therefore, um, also the women's movement in Kurdistan has organized itself in many fields, like from local women's communes and councils to cooperatives, uh, academies, and maybe as you know, as uh, women's self-defense units, which became uh, known in the public by the resistance and uh, the victory in Kobani against Daesh, uh, like uh, against ISIS. Um, but at the same time, while we have to resist at many fronts at the same time, uh, like the building up uh, process, uh, while we were trying to um, develop alternative forms of education, have a different understanding of arts and culture, um, finding out about our uh, politics uh, health, on health and justice and create alternatives because many things are not available here due to embargo and, uh, and war and closed borders. Um, so um, we have actually realized uh, that the revolution has to start in our own minds. So if we want to build up uh, a free life, uh, free relations, a free society that does not reproduce the power structures, we have to think and learn uh, to know and live in a different way. And in this context, our works uh, at the Genealogy Academy um, have been, uh, we are making with the aim to collect and connect women's wisdom and knowledge uh, to share and develop analysis for succeeding a women's revolution. What we call a women's revolution actually means a process of organizing, of creating awareness and social transformation. And it may, means also to overcome state-like structures uh, in our daily lives, in our own habits and, and in our minds. So actually the things that uh, Ruth were mentioning, I think there's a very close connection also on uh, with the ecofeminism uh, in Africa and, and the roots uh, they connect to. Uh, Sherwin, can I, can I get back to you in the next yeah. round? Because uh, I think you, you'll definitely get a chance to go a bit further into this. Uh, this first one, we just wanted to make a very short kind of introductory thing. Is that okay? Okay, it's fine. Just one last sentence I would like uh, to say uh, that it is, uh, we, that we follow our works with the aim to strengthen uh, women's autonomy, uh, democratic structures and mentality in society. Uh, and this is the basis uh, or focus of popular education, women's and men uh, and research works. Thank you. Sorry for the interruption. Um, we move now to uh, Pedro uh, Pontual. Pedro is the uh, honorary president of the Council of Popular Education of Latin America and has also been very active in the Latin American campaign for the right to education. I believe he worked with Paulo Freire and also with some of the Brazilian administrations in trying to adopt or push for uh, radically different forms of education. So Pedro also comes uh, 
from uh, that that perspective of of popular education of radical education uh, pedro can you please uh, tell us a little bit about how your work relates to today's topic uh, you will be speaking in portuguese i think sim eh <coughs> o eu eh o ceao conselho de educação popular da américa latina e do caribe é um movimento de educação popular, de educadores e educadoras, movimentos sociais, organizações, que é, já existe há 40 anos né? e que se dedicam a práticas de educação popular né? é, inspiradas na pedagogia de Paulo Freire. Né? E... É, o, é, em toda em toda em toda a região né? e, do, eu é, vivo no Brasil e portanto pertenço ao coletivo do Ceal no Brasil né? dentre os vários temas é, que o Ceal se dedica né? é, como por exemplo a, educação em direitos humanos, educação e economia solidária, educação é, é, feminista e antipatriarcal, educação e juventude, né? educação de jovens e adultos. Eu me dedico particularmente ao tema da educação e formação política, é, junto a movimentos sociais e governos progressistas. Né? É daí que vem a minha experiência por ter atuado sempre, tanto junto a movimentos sociais, quanto a experiência de, de governos progressistas, tanto a nível de governos locais, quanto uh, na experiência que nós tivemos uh, a nível de, do governo federal. Né? É, nós é, é, consideramos... Né, que a educação popular né, é um elemento fundamental para a construção da democracia. Né? É, é, a, a construção né, de uma contra-hegemonia né, é, popular né, é um elemento fundamental para a remoção do fascismo. Né? E, portanto, é, tra fazer um trabalho permanente né, de educação popular junto às diversas práticas né, de organização popular é um elemento central para a possibilidade de, concentra de consolidação das experiências de democracia radical. Então, é isso a minha contribuição inicial. Yes, uh, Pedro, we will come back to you on some of those issues of popular education and how that relates to, to radical democracy. Uh, we move now on to, uh, on to Eva Schonveld. Eva is uh, with one of the seven global processes that is putting this webinar together, the grassroots to global assemblies. She's also been active with the Extinction Rebellion Scotland, which is where she's based and uh, has been focusing a lot on deliberative assembly processes uh, in cities, uh, as far as I know. So, Eva, can you tell us a little bit more and how it yes. relates to our topic today? Yeah, yeah thank you very much. It's, it's really lovely to be here. Um, great to hear what the other speakers have had to say. And, and actually, there's, there feels like there's so much alignment uh, already in what, in what we're saying. Um, our project is looking at Sort of broadly, uh, who makes decisions and how, um, and is asking a kind of. Deixa eu falar isso, ok? All right, um, and we're also asking, can we make better collective decisions? 
um, without necessarily starting by by uh, with any view on what those decisions ought to be. So the, our, the background of our project is, well, it comes from many different routes, um, but it, it kind of most recently comes from the ex experience of being part of the Extinction Rebellion um, and the three demands that they had are for governments to uh, tell the truth, to act now, and to create a citizens assembly to look at how to solve uh, climate change at a national level. And in the UK and, and in Scotland, we, we got at least two of our, well, two of our, our three demands. We, they, they declared climate emergencies um, and they uh, both uh, governments in different ways created uh, citizens assemblies. Um, but watching how that played out, it became very clear that our governments are not capable of um, taking, taking the issue of climate change seriously. They, they're part of the um, system that is creating it. Um, and it was very clear to us that uh, the governmental route is, is not one that we can take when we're looking at this, this massive emergency that we're all facing. But at the same time, we were, had been exposed to experience of citizens' assemblies and people's assemblies and seen how well they work. Um, which, you know, it's been reflected in, in what the other speakers have been saying, that people coming together with good information and good facilitation um, step up to the responsibility uh, in a really fantastic way and use kind of creative thinking uh, in completely new ways. So we, but we realized that we were starting from a position of being um, uh, climate change activists and the people we were speaking to were mostly climate change activists uh, who all agreed with one another. Um, so we wanted to reach out further and realized that what we had to do was to drop our emergency because it was stopping us from seeing what was important to other people and why they weren't seeing it as the same emergency. Um, and of course, what we see is that, is that there are lots of emergencies happening all at the same time for different people in different places. Um, there's mental health emergencies all over. People are not feeling safe. Um, there's huge poverty, uh, racism, there's health inequalities, there's land grab. We know, that, you know, we know the picture of the world that we're looking at. Um, and, but, but what happens when you, when you, when you drop your, uh, what happened for us when we dropped our agenda and, and wanted to hear from other people what their, what their problems were, was that the conversation just changed radically. And we started to see the connections between all these emergencies that happen at the systemic level. And basically the system of, of capitalism, the system of the, the kind of, um, that we've inherited from the, the incredibly awful colonial period um, has, has been busy causing all these problems for us. Um, so we want to, we're starting to work in Scotland and in, in, uh, currently in three cities and looking for more to run very grassroots people's assemblies and to uh, look at, at what is needed to uh, re-engage people who, who in our country have been very strongly uh, disengaged from politics and political processes. Um, and then also to reach out internationally, to talk to people who are already doing these things in their communities, seeing what works, uh, whether it's these kind of modern uh, uh, citizens assemblies and people's assemblies, or whether it's traditional um, practices that have been done for, for centuries, if not millennia. Um, and we're inviting um, people to come to a, a gathering at the end of May, an online gathering where we can have those conversations. We can find out what are the principles that underlie these different ways of doing things. Because we're never gonna find one size that fits all. But we're looking for um, whether we can create collective processes that, that go beyond our communities and our national boundaries and that, that allow us to come together as a globe to tackle these, these high level issues like climate change and neoliberal capitalism. That we really want to um, yeah, create uh, to uh, processes that can enable us to challenge the legitimacy of the governments that we currently have, um, because they're so well, because they're so well done. So we're learning how to uh, the different ways that we can create decision-making processes that really involve people and and tap into that collective genius that people can have, 
and reaching possibly for a global citizens assembly or some kind of democratic process at the end of 2022 when COP as it will inevitably fails um, and make that a moment of challenge um, around uh, contesting where legitimacy, where the, the legitimacy to, to make our collective decisions lies. Um, Thanks, Eva. I'll come back to you. Uh, yesterday, there was a session also at the World Social Forum on a global citizens parliament. Maybe that idea also, it's uh, potential and pitfalls can come into this discussion later. Uh, I'm going to move to Boaventura. Uh, Boaventura de Souza Santos is a very well known uh, academic, intellectual scholar in the, um, especially the field of decolonizing epistemologies, um, sort of uh, breaking down the Western notions of democracy. Um, and uh, um, is, I mean, there's many different uh, ways to introduce him, but he's Emeritus Professor of Sociology in the University of Coimbra in Portugal. Um, he's also a distinguished legal scholar at the University of Wisconsin, Madison. Uh, Boa, over to you for this question. Hi, Ashish. It's a great pleasure to be here with you, with such wonderful people and some very old friends. Well, my <clears throat> trajectory as a kind of a rear guard intellectual with 50% uh, of my time in activism and 50% uh, in the academic life has uh, three characteristics that in a sense uh, will anticipate what I'll be saying in the following later on on the second question. I've been of course very much interested in working uh, with the social movements I created in the World Social Forum in 2003 the Popular University of the Social Movements. And this is an initiative of uh, popular education, very much influenced by Paulo Freire, of course, updated to our current needs, and in which we are trying to bring together academic knowledge and uh, uh, popular knowledges. And it was created by this double request that we found in the first meetings of the World Social Forum. On one side, a, a cleavage, an, an abyss between academic uh, knowledge and popular knowledge, and also a very, very large difference among different knowledges, women's knowledges, indigenous knowledges, urban knowledges, peasant knowledge, so to overcome that. The second one has been to working with the, the nation, the state at the municipal level. So I started a project at the, in Porto Alegre, as you know, the city where the World Social Forum was founded in 2001. From 1989 on, we uh, in the West, it was the first experience of participatory budgeting at the municipal level. So I was very active in launching and in working with and doing research with, collaborative research, with the participatory uh, uh, project uh, uh, budget in this case. And thirdly, I have not uh, uh, given up the idea of the state, of transforming the state. I was consultant to the constitution of Bolivia and Ecuador uh, during an attempt for a plurinational state. And in fact, I continue to do so in three hours time. I'll be uh, giving a presentation and working with the Colombian constitutional court. Uh, on my topic, which has been uh, the, the rights of the indigenous peoples in Latin America and how we can transform the monocultural state into a plurinational state. So that's it. Thanks, Boa, short and succinct. Um, and finally, uh, we move to Arturo Escobar. Arturo is a Colombian activist uh, researcher very prominent work on struggles against extractivist development, on, on post-development, post-capitalism, and so on. He was still recently at the University of North Carolina and now teaches in two universities in uh, Columbia. Uh, he's a prolific author, lots and lots of books and, and you know, hundreds of articles. Uh, and I had the great honor of uh, working with him to co-edit uh, our latest book, Pluriverse. Rivers. Arturo, over to you. Good morning, everybody. Thanks, Ashish and Spristri. Great to see everybody. And what I've been doing over the past 25, almost 30 years, 
has been working mostly with Afro-Colombian feminist and environmental organizations in Colombia and other parts of Latin America on issues of defense of their territories and cultures. And something that has become very clear to me over the years is the fact that many of these struggles are the struggles for the defense of the right of communities and peoples to exist as the kinds of communi communities and peoples that they are and they wish to be. And this is a dimension maybe of uh, debates about democracy that is rarely discussed because it, it goes beyond the nation state. And uh, this is what I mean, maybe we can call it the pluriversal democracy or the pluriverse, pluriversal dimension of democracy. And what I mean by that is the democracy that would fulfill or respect the rights of peoples to exist and the kinds of peoples that they are. We could call it ontological democracy, if you wish, or the ontological dimension of democracy, if you wanted to use sort of the fancy academic word of ontology. And uh, so this dimension is very important to me, is it, it, basically has, was put on the map by the Zapatista of Chiapas when they started to talk about the pluriverse as a, the world where many, many worlds can fit. Meaning by that again, where all peoples can have the right to exist at the kinds of peoples that they are and having their own ways of being and doing and thinking. And finally, that for me, this is also a very important dimension of the struggle against terricide. And terricide is a relatively new concept, concept that has been coined by the indigenous movement, um, the movement of indigenous women for buen vivir, for well-being or collective well-being in South America. And uh, in the belief that we all live under ontological occupation, the occupation by one particular way of being and thinking about the world, globalized capitalist, heteropatriarchal and so forth. And hence that liberation has to have also that dimension of, of both being a pluriversal strategy, but also once, one that is against terrorism. Thank you. Thanks, uh, thanks, Arturo, introducing a new word, uh, terricide, and maybe you can go a little bit further into that uh, in, this, in the second round. So we're going to launch straight into the second round. What I've seen, uh, I'm not in any way going to attempt to summarize this first round, uh, but I've seen there's some very interesting common themes, but also possibly um, some contestations or small tensions, uh, especially, for instance, between the uh, exclusive or predominant focus on radical democracy and the focus on still working with the state, uh, both of which probably have their own legitimacy. Um, the importance of popular education, of uh, feminist and eco-feminist uh, approaches, um, looking at or questioning borders and boundaries as we see them today, the point that Sherwin, for instance, mentioned. Uh, and the crucial importance all across of people's assemblies, of deliberative processes in which everybody can take part. Okay, uh, I'm going to do another round now. And uh, instead of seven minutes, I'd request five if it's possible, because uh, the first round has been a bit longer than what we anticipated. And I do want to make sure that we have at least 45 minutes or one hour for the other participants to jump in and give comments or ask questions. Um, for the sake of uh, Ease, I'll carry on with the same sequence. Kali, um, one of the things that I think uh, in the in the movements that you spoke about and from what I know of your work is uh, is on the notion of power itself. And I think you've sort of briefly mentioned it. Um, how do you think the kind of movements you've been part of sort of challenges the currently currently predominant notion of what power is, which is power over, power to dominate, power to sort of, uh, you know, hierarchical uh, power. Uh, how does your work kind of transform that into a different notion of power? And what does that then mean for democracy? Ooh, um, five minutes. Uh, <laughs> um, well, let me, let me start by saying, um, you know, our, our movement has been very much not only focus on um, 
trying to transform the capitalist system. It's also been very much focusing on uh, trying to dismantle uh, the system of white supremacy as it expresses itself here in the United States and the very particular types of power over uh, that that you know embodies. Um, now that's built upon uh, you know heteropatriarchy. Uh, it's built upon a particular notion of uh, Judeo-Christian uh, kind of authority uh, and orientation, and all of these uh, combined you know, have, have seriously limited and distorted the practice of anything resembling democracy uh, in the, you know, in our context. And I think it's, it's very keen on what we all, uh, what we say in our movement time and time again, is that for those of us who live inside of this project, we have not known democracy. It's not something that we've experienced in any fundamental, in any fundamental way. What we have experienced are various types of, um, logics and uh, practices to get those who have been subjected to these practices to buy into their, you know, uh, uh, their continuance is the only thing I could really, you know, put it to get us to rationalize and justify being dominated in this particular way uh, and to validate it. And you see that really breaking down uh, here in the United States on what happened with this insurrection uh, uh, in Washington, D.C. Uh, wherein one of the major kind of animuses of and reasons behind that um, is how this particular framework uh, is being challenged and is being, being dismantled and why there's such a reactionary movement to try to reclaim um, old positions in society or the traditional positions uh, in society, particularly by uh, the white men who make up the vast majority of those who participated in that movement. Uh, and so we've been very much trying to dismantle that project, not with the, with the aim of dehumanizing another group of people. That's not the aim. It's not the objective. It's actually about how do we humanize ourselves and reach our, our full potential on the small little precious, you know, blue green planet that we inhabit that we're going to share with each other regardless, because there is no other place for us to go. Uh, and so we have to figure out, you know, how we're going to make this work. And the, the challenging in trying to invert these notions of power and possession and containment is one of the critical things that we have been really trying to grow into and really trying to do a lot of work in our community, particularly the last couple of years. And I think COVID has made this even, um, brought this particular point home about how we need to be in close proximity and practice with each other so we understand what all of our needs are and how do we collectively uh, uh, practice these needs and then communicate about what we want. Because the way in which, uh, what I mean by the, the way in which the shutdowns here have happened have been focused primarily on uh, a public health or public safety kind of narrative. But what they leave out in our case uh, in, in Jackson, Mississippi, is that not everyone in our community has a home that they can kind of retreat to and isolate in. Uh, we have a tremendous houseless population in the city of Jackson, which is only growing. Uh, and the way in which certain things are framed with, as, as, as power and privileges within the policy actually just aggravated more of the, the public health crisis because it just revealed you know, tremendously that these type of policies are based upon certain power relationships, certain property relationships. And then if we don't try to intervene and transform the state to deal with these particular issues, there is no, no fundamental way that this system as it presently exists could, could do anything to stop the spread of something like COVID-19 because it's not based upon care. It's not based upon uh, 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 um, transformative relationships. It's not based upon a real practice of, of empathy and connectivity. And so these are some critical things that how we are trying to re-articulate power so that there's power with at every level, within every practice. And it's not easy. Uh, um, I don't want to get anybody any false notion that 
Um, this is something that you can theorize and then and, and, uh, experiment with it and automatically comes uh, uh, into being uh, because there's a tremendous amount of re-socializing that we have to do so that we see ourselves beyond our particular points of either privilege or uh, uh, being oppressed in order to be transformed and to be transformative in the process. So uh, for us, we've just experienced a tremendous amount of bumps in the road of trying to uh, build a different society. But I would argue that it's, it's well worth it. Uh, the alternative of continuing uh, with the path you know, that has been set us for us, uh, rooted in capitalism, rooted in heteropatriarchy, rooted in white supremacy. Um, this is the second time I've heard this term terrorcide within the week. So it's one that I'm definitely adopting and trying to bring to our movement because that's, that's, that is what it's aiming for. And if we keep following this path, you know, our species won't be here too long. That's the reality of, I think, what we're facing. And, and we have to bring this kind of uh, notion of transforming ourselves and transforming the system through connectivity and connected relationships from the bottom up. I think the challenge is very notion of decentralized power from that kind of eradicated aspects of it, uh, at least power over from our minds and from our lexicon. Thanks, uh, thanks, Kali. Uh, I think the this this mix of uh, honesty, uh, not trying to sort of pretend that everything is rosy and it's going fantastic, uh, but also the hope of the kind of transformations that you're attempting and already making on the ground. That's that's amazing. Uh, and when you mentioned uh, no hope for our species, I also uh, remembered that maybe the eighth space on this panel should have been for the rest of nature. Uh, I don't know exactly how, but we should always remember that there's uh, 50 million other species, or I don't know how many, 500 million other species uh, that coexist or should be coexisting, allowed to coexist with us on the earth. And uh, uh, how do we bring them into our notions of democracy is also something that we should always keep in mind, I think. Thanks, Kali. Um, Ruth, um, I'm going to shift the question a little bit. Of course, they're all related. But uh, given your struggles with, uh, with the movements in Kenya and other parts of Africa, um, including of resistance, how do you think the sort of combination of resistance and creating constructive alternatives could challenge authoritarianism or the currently sort of uh, undemocrat forms of democracy? Okay, uh, so I just first of all want to start and say that children are playing outside. So if you hear any screaming, nothing is nothing bad is happening. Children are basically being children. Um, your question is is um, is very important and has been very important to my work personally, but also in the movement spaces that have been very privileged to be part of. One of the things that I must say is that our work around ecology, for example, one of the things that has been very, very clear to us is that, you know, resisting within the, you know, the physical boundaries or the, you know, the age old colonial boundaries of the nation state um, can, no, can no longer deliver anything for us as movements, if it ever could. Um, we've seen in the last decade, you know, um, you know, whether it's, you know, the, you know, seed and trade laws that criminalize the rights of peasant farmers to save, save, save sell and exchange their seeds. These are laws that are not just being passed in Kenya, you know, in the parliament in Kenya or the parliament in Uganda or the parliament in South Africa or Nigeria. These are laws that are being passed at regional economic uh, bodies. So it has meant that um, eco-feminist movements, uh, movements for ecology, movements for rights, you know, have had to think radically about coming together you know, as collectives from across diff different countries with colonially imposed borders to resist not just the, you know, the power of one, you know, autocrat or dictator in one particular country, but to think through the creation of the kinds of spaces that we have, you know, thinking as about borders, um, you know, um, they are fluid in as much as, um, you know, the material impacts of having these borders remains uh, very, very real, uh, especially to those marginalized, um, you know, to the oppressed, you know, to the wretched of the earth, if I should use um, the particular term. But I think, again, to go back to the fact that transnational organizing work has been very central um, in terms of 
thinking through power, thinking through how, uh, thinking through about alternatives, because you can't just have alternatives in one local space. You have to think about power, not just in your own area, whether in Nairobi or Kisumu or Kampala, but you have to think about power collectively across different spaces. And that has been difficult to think through. I want to romanticize the idea of transnational or transversal organizing on this continent. Again, as I've said, um, you know, we have colonially imposed borders whose material impacts um, and effects are very real to so many people, especially those most marginalized and on the front lines of multiple and intersecting um, inequalities. Of course, as I started out earlier in my initial presentation, uh, talking about how NGOized the organizing and movement work has been. And this then is me <laughs> <It's love. laughs> I, Okay, I'm sorry. Um, again, going back to the enjoyization of um, our work and our radical politics, and that's why radical political education, radical feminist popular political education has become very central um, to so many of us, not just to recover as a process of recovering radical memory or recovering memory, but also as a process of seeing what new worlds are possible. Right, not just as a, as a process of resisting, right, but as a process of regeneration, you know, as a process of building um, towards a new world of liberation that we see. So this, this for me, I'd say, has been very central in terms of thinking about alternatives, right, the recovering of the memory work. Um, thinking through how different collectives come together and think about the state, not as just one country in one particular space, but thinking about power, you know, in much more complicated and much more nuanced ways. And of course, as feminists, it's also been to complicate even the notions of power, the notions of resistance, you know, is co-creating worlds in which those of us who are feminists, those of us who are queer, those of us who are not the normative idea of human, who is supposed to belong, can actually um, not belong. I don't want to use a liberal idea or understanding of belonging because we're not interested in you know, liberal diversity and inclusion, but we're interested in shaking the foundations of the system and co-creating a new world where all of us um, you know, can be there and be in that space in more radical ways. So I'd say that for us, these two processes have been very um, instrumental in us thinking about, um, um, you know, um, a collective or a transnational form of, uh, of organizing. Yeah. Thanks, Ruth. Uh, maybe, I mean, uh, I got one or two questions, but we can come back to that uh, in, in the discussion round, uh, and then you'll get some final words also. Thanks for that. Uh, I'm going to move to uh, to to Sherwin. Um, I think, I mean, in your initial remarks, you were you you spoke about uh, the need to and how you looked at uh, the dissolving of the boundaries, the nation state boundaries within which the the entire Kurdish and other ethnic communities are living. Um, what are the sorts of key lessons that are emerging for a process of democracy which attempts to in that sense, dissolve nation state boundaries? And what are the sorts of specific relations between, let's say, the community on the ground, the commune or the municipality, and the larger entire Kurdish Rojava or the Kurdish territory? I think one very important point, or what also made this uh, process in Rojava possible was to have a clear view about the basic principles and methods where we what do we want to reach how do we want to live how do we want to organize so the concepts of democratic autonomy or in connection with democratic confederalism that were developed by Abdullah Ejelan who is in prison still uh, in solitary confinement in Turkey have really um, given a, a very important theoretical foundation for the small steps that were done in practice and also are a kind of uh, measure or um, yeah, measures where we can uh, relate our praxis uh, towards. So I think um, like on one hand to have uh, very clear uh, the principles, the methods to connect them with your aims uh, uh, on this way of building up uh, an alternative system 
um, is one hand, but on the other hand, also uh, we learned that it is important to be flexible and use different methods uh, and tactics on this way, which is full of, of obstacles and in which uh, hegemonial powers and nation states that tried, uh, that are in conflict with each other, try to squeeze you in the middle. So any way or any forum that is that we can use for um, uh, for limiting the power of the state on people's lives and for making for creating uh, the possibility to um, uh, speak freely to think freely to determine our own lives uh, we have to develop this one point of this can be also to join mechanisms of representative democracy, but how much do they really exist? For instance, if we look at North Korea, in Turkey, the majority of elected members, they are today arrested and they have been displaced by, displaced, uh, by, um, uh, yeah, by dictators from the government that Erdogan sent to to these uh, places, and so um, there's it, there's uh, even if you use these kind of mechanisms, there's no guarantee in anything. Um, still, we are also demanding uh, official recognition of the um, self-administrative region here in North and Eastern Syria. Um, but at the same time, we know them doesn't have uh, much interest in, in it because uh, they, are, they are focusing on how they can exploit uh, and divide uh, the resources uh, in this region. Uh, so um, the very basic or the most important thing is uh, that really this process of uh, aiming at reducing and overcoming the influence of power uh, of state, of he hegemonic powers, in all aspects of life, uh, that we take this as our basis, like to strengthen the self-awareness, the political engagement, and uh, the ethical values, uh, like justice, solidarity, and respect uh, in the whole society. Uh, it's just, yeah, also a, a process of the different um, cultural, religious groups uh, overcoming this place of dividing and ruling, getting to know each other. And this was a process that really happened uh, for the people here during the last uh, decade. Uh, so together organizing communes and people's uh, assemblies, um, a communal ecologi uh, ecological economy, people's or co uh, cooperatives, um, academy self-defense forces in which all the different communities uh, participate in. This is uh, the guarantee for the survival and for the future. Um, and at the same time, it is cha challenging uh, the concept of a nation state, which never had uh, brought any um, improvement to the societies uh, here. It has been a, um, an instrument of colonialism in the Middle East, uh, as well as in other parts of the world. So I think uh, instead of trying to uh, put the focus on how to reform the state to really name and see that the state is not serving the people but always has been an instrument um, of power and uh, ruling over people um, so um, to focus on building up uh, uh, alternative structures from the grassroots uh, this is uh, what we really have to concentrate on and maybe there are many obstacles and shortcomings uh, that we have here um, and um, Maybe not everything is functioning as it is in the in the theory, but there it's a constant process of reflection, self-reflection, of trying to do it better. And also, a system cannot be built up uh, within one two years. Um, but every like you try to solve a problem, then a new problem appears in front of you, and then you come together. You think what needs to be done, and you find new ways. Um, but I just want to give one example um, about like the Corona crisis uh, that is now going on all over the world. Uh, we have been in touch with many people from different countries uh, that uh, say like how they felt uh, desperate in this time of lockdown, how lonely uh, they are um, and uh, that the health systems have collapsed uh, in the richest countries. But, um, of course, we know why, but um, 
it's interesting to see that just when this happened uh, here uh, in, we were able in the women's village uh, in uh, Jinwar, um, which is, I think, for the first time in this geography, that uh, a communal way of living, of producing, of uh, decision making has been organized by women. Uh, there uh, has been opened uh, a women's clinic under the name Shifa Jin, which means healing women. And they uh, gathered, uh, like young women, old women, uh, gathered the knowledge about uh, natural medicine, uh, healing practices, local knowledge. Um, and they have been able to respond to the needs of the people, not only of the village, but in the surrounding and uh, in this region and the su surrounding villages. So um, while on one hand, uh, health system is collapsing uh, here, uh, although we uh, have the embargo, although none of the uh, UN supplies that are sent to Syria is reaching even this region, um, with our own capacities and uh, possibilities, we are trying to find solutions. And even some advancements has been have been made uh, in uh, ensuring uh, a better health uh, uh, or healthcare for for the people here. Just to give this as one example, um, and maybe another um, uh, thing that really moved us or is, was very important for us during the last days. Uh, when we started with the building up process of uh, genealogy, um, and we, uh, like the, uh, in many regions, uh, women came together and uh, set up uh, regional um, research centers. Um, uh, in the first one had been opened in Afrin in 2017, and uh, one year later, not even one year later, it was occupied by the Turkish state. The center was destroyed and its members were displaced. Um, but two weeks ago, uh, some of our members who were displaced from Afrin, they opened again a new general re research center, center in Shefa. This is now a region where uh, hundreds of thousands of people from Afrin uh, are living in tents and refugee camps and uh, daily they are confronted with a shell bombing of the Turkish army, uh, children, women, uh, casualties uh, uh, we have day by day. But uh, women from Shehba, like in this region, said uh, that genealogy brings a seed of strength and hope back to them. And uh, this connection uh, to life, uh, uh, this hope, um, is the big biggest remedy against the despair and the hopelessness uh, that um, is uh, imposed by the system uh, on the people. Thank you, Sherwin. I think for most of us on this call, it's very hard to even imagine being in a situation like this. And the fact that the community can still do uh, amazing things like the genealogy center and community-based research and all the other alternatives is uh, extremely inspiring. Uh, Pedro, you spoke uh, a lot about popular education and the, and, and the need for radical education for creating change and transformation. Uh, but you're also, you also lived through dictatorships or fascist uh, regimes. Um, how do you combine the resistance to these sorts of regimes with alternative popular education? Um, and what kind of lessons emerge from, from that for democracy? Bem, eu acho que a gente tem, a gente tem alguns sinais é, recentes na América Latina, é, importantes, esperançadores, e as quais a gente deve dar atenção antes de falar dos casos do Brasil. O primeiro deles que eu mencionaria são as, é a experiência das assembleias territoriais no Chile, né? é, que foram uma base, estão sendo uma base muito importante né? de, de diálogo né? com é, o povo chileno, com os seus problemas cotidianos. 
e com toda uma metodologia né, que que está dando suporte à organização dessas assembleias territoriais e que deu sustentação né, para todas as mobilizações na Praça dos, indig... dos Indignados, né? durante todo o período das grandes mobilizações e que deu sustentação também né, para as mobilizações pró-constituinte no Chile. Então, acho que essa é uma experiência importante. A segunda que eu mencionaria é, é a mobilização dos movimentos de mulheres e movimentos feministas na Argentina, né? que recentemente aprovaram é, a lei é, do aborto. Uma terceira é, é, manifestação importante né, é a retomada da democracia na Bolívia. Né, quando parecia que nós estávamos diante de um golpe é, que duraria muito tempo né, para ser revertido, né? É, a organização dos movimentos indígenas camponeses e do próprio e do próprio MAS, né, movimento é, alternativo ao socialismo, né, permitiu que no prazo de um ano né, se retomasse o processo democrático na Bolívia. No caso da Colômbia, né, o Arturo pode falar mais, mas é, a manifestação que ficou conhecido como Laminga, né? É manifestação indígenas afro-camposinos que conseguiram romper o cerco do confinamento, cerca de 5 mil, que fizeram uma marcha da região de Calca a Bogotá, reivindicando, né? É, a questão da paz, a questão da, da vida nos territórios, né? E a questão é, da democracia. Então, são todas é, formas de resistência que conseguiram, é, digamos, é, golpear né, é, os regimes é, fascistas né, é, e produzir alternativas. No caso do Brasil, né, eu mencionaria aqui a experiência né, do movimento dos trabalhadores sem terra, né, que, é, a partir das experiências nos assentamentos, né, as experiências de resistência, né, e que, com um fortíssimo trabalho de formação política, né? através de escolas que é, abrangem todas as gerações, desde as crianças, né? os jovens, os adultos, né? um trabalho muito intenso de formação política, né? é, conseguem produzir hoje né? uma política nacional de agroecologia. Né? E, e, com isso, né, é, chegar a níveis de, de produção mesmo agrícola né, bastante significativos, o que fez com que, por exemplo, neste período da, da Covid, né, é, o movimento pudesse desenvolver ações de solidariedade né, com as populações urbanas, né, que é, enfrentavam situações de fome bastante significativas. Né? É, citaria também a experiência do movimento dos trabalhadores sem teto, né? aqui no caso, o movimento urbano, né? que, a partir das suas ocupações em áreas urbanas, consegue, a partir de um forte trabalho também de educação popular, informação consegue produzir moradias populares a partir de um processo autogestionado, né? acessando fundos públicos. No plano da democracia representativa, 
eu citaria uma experiência que é mais recente, que é a experiência dos mandatos coletivos, né? que são experiências é, que é, buscam romper a legislação eleitoral de gente e eleger, é, eleger representantes parlamentares né? através de um processo em que é, passam uma pessoa é eleita formalmente, mas, na verdade, são eleitas mais de uma pessoa junto com ela, né? é, representando vários segmentos sociais, sobretudo mulheres, negras, LGBTIs, né? e que são fruto né? de um trabalho coletivo e que exercem coletivamente esse esse mandato, com um forte controle social sobre o mandato. Essa tem sido uma experiência muito significativa de ampliar né, os limites da, da, da democracia coletiva, da democracia representativa no plano é, do legislativo. E... É, a experiência a qual o Boaventura já se referiu, né, dos orçamentos participativos, né, que ainda em alguns municípios onde a gente é, tem governos progressistas, né, significa a possibilidade, né, através de uma participação direta dos cidadãos, né? de discutir o, o orçamento municipal e de definir prioridades é, de, 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 de aplicação dos recursos públicos. E isso se estende para outras definições em relação à vida do, do município. Então, me parece que esses são sinais. E em todos esses processos... né? É, a educação popular é um suporte fundamental né, para assegurar é, que se desenvolva consciência de cidadania, né, consciência de que esses são espaços que é, são direitos dos cidadãos. Thank you, uh, gracias, Pedro. Uh... Eva, I'm going to turn to you with a maybe slightly provocative question, which is because you mentioned uh, that one can't really rely on the state uh, anymore, if one could ever. Uh, and so the crucial importance of focusing on deliberative, uh, radical participatory processes, radical democracy on the ground. Um, some of what we're hearing from Pedro and earlier what uh, Boa Ventura had said is also the need to continue working with the state in terms of policy shifts or making it accountable to actually be the guarantor of, uh, of rights and uh, human rights and other rights and also welfare. So do you think there is a tension between the two or can the two go together in the work that you're doing? What's your experience? Um, <clears throat> yeah, thank you. Um, I think, I think we have to do everything <laughs> um, and that's okay because there's lots of us so we can all do different things. Um, uh, I, I think it's essential that people are working with their local authorities and their national authorities to try to make the best um, situation for people on the ground that they possibly can. Um, at the same time, the, the, the initiative that I'm involved with is very strongly looking at um, the possibility that we could do better um, and really trying to experiment um, and collaborate and connect uh, around how we build a, a completely different system. And, and that needs time to for those conversations to happen, for those processes to mature, uh, for people to um, fall out and work out how to deal with conflict between them, because that's what always happens with people. We always fall out. Um, but there are there are really good ways of um, using our conflicts to create uh, new um, scenarios that we maybe hadn't even imagined. 
Um, and I think that it's really important for us um, in looking at how this uh, this other system might be to identify, you know, what's what's at the core of the system that we have that isn't working for us. Um, and the you know people here have have expressed it very well in different ways. The way that we express it is that it, it's a it's a system of domination um, that has that has kind of come out of the whole colonial process and has been active on the colonized countries and the people in them, um, but also in the colonizing countries. Um, and where it works most potently is actually inside of each of us, because it's traumatic to live in a system of domination. It's traumatic to be a to be a dominator, and it's traumatic to be dominated. Um, and uh, we're we're interested in this role of trauma um, because it is a it is a kind of a an inherent um, physiological process that happens for all of us uh, around different things, um, around around uh, insults to our autonomy, uh, one way or another, right from when we're we're very small children. And when our, uh, our trauma kind of exists in patterns that live in our in nervous system and in our bodies, um, and when it is triggered, we actually stop being able to think properly. We, we start thinking as that trauma. Um, and you, you can see this happening in, in lots of people in government who, who, are, who are continually in the grip of their, of their trauma and uh, are completely unable to empathize with other people. Um, I, I, we, we think that our, and I think I you know, share, share with the rest of you, um, the belief that our, our systems of governance need to be founded on empathy. Um, and so being sharp and aware to uh, what trauma is, to how it's happening, and to when it's happening in, in us, each of us, um, at any moment, and to, to develop the skills and resources to be able to deal with it, both in ourselves and when it happens between us. Um, is absolutely essential to, to making this new politics different and, uh, and much less uh, able to be co-opted and corrupted in the way that uh, the previous one has. We have to get it right this time. Um, you know, as Callie was saying, we don't have long uh, in terms of the, the kind of the, the, our actual ability to, to subsist on the planet. Um, and that... Uh, that urgency that is now even being felt by you know the middle class um, it, we, we all feel the urgency in different ways and for some people this the, 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 the kind of um, crisis of capitalism has been acting on them and their communities for centuries for those of us in the, in the um, richer countries you know who've done okay who've been born into relatively um, affluent families if the, the climate change crisis hit like a ton of bricks. It's like that was the thing that we noticed. And, and somebody in the in the chat was asking about the, the wretched of the earth and the, and the big fight, the big pushback that happened when Extinction Rebellion was saying the climate crisis is everything, nothing else matters. You know, you won't be able to, to poverty doesn't matter if your planet has died and, you know, all this kind of uh, yeah, a very naive um, way and, and very superficial way of seeing what was happening, I think was, was part of the kind of maturation process. Um, it, it certainly for, for uh, our project, we're seeing that uh, climate change is just another symptom of the same system where uh, the, the, the intention is to, is to dominate and control um, and, and also to stratify. Us. So there's always somebody who's got a little bit more power uh, than us who can enact it on us. And there's always somebody below us who's got a little bit less power. Uh, and it keeps us apart from one another. So that, that kind of whole inner process, I think people have been pointing it in different ways. But I, I feel that it's really crucial to um, uh, get our heads around it and to understand it and to ha have that kind of uh, it's, it's, it's honesty and it's vulnerability, because if we acknowledge um, our trauma, it can be really frightening. And yet I feel that that's, that's one of the keys to creating uh, a, a, a different system that, that is really, truly human. Um, and, and that's a lot of what we're doing in this project is looking at, so how do we create the conditions that we're told that we're essentially greedy and competitive and violent by, by capitalism? Well, we know that we're collaborative. 
and loving and sensitive. And actually it's, it's our conditions, it's the conditions around us that enable us to step into those uh, more pro-social ways of behaving. Um, so how can we create the conditions that mitigate our least social aspects and support our best? Um, there's, there's hundreds of examples. And there's lots of kind of deliberative and direct democracy processes. There's loads of traditional and indigenous processes. Um, there's, there's systems like sociocracy for decision making, which are which are incredibly helpful tools. And we need everything that we can get to to be able to create this kind of pluralistic, pluriversistic, um, very diverse uh, network of of processes that that somehow need at some point to come together. Um, um, yeah, and, and we're so we're particularly inspired by the kind of um, people's assembly idea. So people's assemblies are, are broad and wide. They call in uh, anyone who cares about this issue, whether they love it or they hate it, and then tries to create these kind of engaging processes. The best way to, to take power over people is to bore them. It's like we have to create processes that are juicy and exciting and interesting to be part of with trustworthy information and good facilitation for people who maybe have never been in those kinds of uh, situations before. Um, and maybe these can be the drivers of the good solutions, of the new solutions. Um, citizens' assemblies are much more kind of narrow. They're, they're a representative sample of the population who's, who's, being, who's, who's having to decide. Um, just a, a much smaller number of people, but they're very well resourced in terms of being able to call for uh, different kinds of information um, through expert witnesses that they're, they're very well facilitated and they're given time and space to really think things through and talk things through and listen to one another and so it's not done in this kind of urgent uh, context where many of our decisions in, in, in kind of ordinary democracy happen um, and maybe those could be the the engines that that then decide between these these different um, uh, uh, new policies that have been come out, coming out of people's assemblies. So we're seeing, Thanks. yeah, okay. <laughs> There's sorry, loads more. Sorry, sorry, I thought you'd finished. Is, I'm, I'm happy to stop there. I've probably gone on too long. Thanks, thanks, Eva. And I think the uh, you brought out the crucial importance of the inner dimension, sort of looking within ourselves and the dealing with trauma and, and of humanizing, which is something that uh, Kali also mentioned. It's not about demonizing the other, but how do we actually humanize uh, ourselves and everybody else around us to make these things happen? Uh, I'm gonna ask uh, Boa Ventura, um, again, maybe a slightly different question, which is that uh, um, to my understanding, Western liberal democracy has either erased or displaced a whole lot of traditional ways of governance, not all of which were necessarily democratic or uh, socially just, but they were there. And some of them are coming back or have been sustained in indigenous peoples or other communities. Um, in this whole notion of decolonizing um, epistemologies, but also decolonizing democracy or governance itself, what do you think is the potential of other forms of you know, traditional or other forms of democracy or of governance in, uh, to, to, to move towards more socially just and ecologically sustainable systems? Thank you, wonderful question, Ashish. Well, I've been thinking it has been a very rich panel and uh, quite frankly, I think that each period struggles and resists with the weapons at hand. So we have to start from what we have. There was a time in which there was a centrally commanded type of revolutions that were very transformative. We are not there. What do we have? Diversity, epistemological diversity, political diversity. This panel is a very good demonstration of that. What uh, some people call different forms of democracy, I would say demo diversity. Even we have been using this concept of demo diversity because I think that we need as much biodiversity as we need a demo diversity. So we have this diversity. The second point of our time is that the global power is very arrogant. They think they have defeated all the enemies and they have been thinking that <clears throat> since the fall of the Berlin Wall. 
we are so much really threat that I like so much whatever just said because the question of honesty of trauma because after all we are talking about our needs within the silos of capitalism look how much money we are giving to the owner of this platform zoom while we are speaking but this guy made millions and millions of dollars in the last two months so in order to be anti-capitalist we have to run the capitalist system i mean it's in a sense this should give a a sense of humbleness to our work. So I start from the assumption that one of the characteristics of our time is that domination, in fact, acts globally and in articulation, capitalism, colonialism, and patriarchy. And the drama of our time is that resistance is fragmented. Some people are very intent, interested in struggling against capitalism, but not against racism or against sexism. Others probably focus solely on anti-racism, but they leave aside the anti-capitalist struggle or anti-sexist struggle. So I think we have to unite the resistance. And I think the World Social Forum could be a very good instrument to unite these struggles. So what do we have now? We have institutions, we have streets, and we have communities. This is the three that we have now. And I think we cannot waste any one of those, quite frankly. And it is really wrong if we start thinking that one struggle is better than the other in general. Struggles are very different, according to different contexts. Some things that can be done in Europe cannot be done in Africa or in Asia and vice versa. And even in a given country, what can be done in Scotland cannot be probably be done in Wales. I mean, we never know. So I think that we have to be very contextual. So we have to work with, and that would be my idea, is that one foot in the institutions and one foot outside the institutions, extra institutions, the streets. We on the left, that's why I consider myself, we have not the monopoly of the streets anymore. We know that the extreme right is ready to go to the streets and take over, take control of the streets in many countries, even my own country. So I think that we have to start from that. If you do that, then we cannot wait struggles and we have to work with the different institutions because as Pedro was saying, even the liberal democracy reconstructs itself, renews itself and you should use these opportunities. So the institutions that we have are the state, human rights, democracy, law, these things. Different countries, you can use them in different ways, but never just rely on institutions. If you rely on institutions, you are doomed. The only way for is the I've been in the Bolivia and the Ecuador very active, and I'll be very active in Chile now. And what I'm telling them is that please learn from our mistakes in the previous decade, because we managed to develop a new constitution. And when the new constitution was there, we dismantled. Because after all, the, 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 the victory was there. We had a new constitution. Now, on the contrary, this is the first day of the struggle. Struggle that the constitution is to, going to be defended. Because otherwise, the movement to undo the constitution will start right away. It did that in Ecuador. It was was the case in Bolivia, it will be the case in Chile. So I think that we need all different kinds of struggles. For instance, one in my work for Rojava, and I'm so pleased to have served in here. I mean, um, you know, collaborate with people, you know, you know, David Graeber, great friend of that was so much, paid so much attention to Rojava. We need liberated zones. And I think they are a liberated zone, as the Zapatistas are a liberated zone. But there are other strategies. We have to work with the states. And what is the state? The state is an abstraction because you can work at the municipal level. For instance, we have, for instance, even in India, look at India. If you look at the figures on the pandemic between Kerala and the state of India, there are two different realities. In Brazil, between Niterói or Araquara and the federal state is a different story. So you have different realities a given state. And then don't forget the global. 
side. We may be very much enthusiastic about our grassroots movement and we should be. I've been all for, for it. And I've been working basically at that level. But I have to say that I'm here representing what we call the, the group for the renewal of the World Social Forum, because we think that we need a global dimension on this. We need some uh, a political actor at the global level, democratically built, based on deliberation, what kinds of deliberations and how we reach them, it will be a problem and we have to discuss that and we have time until Mexico to decide on the best ways to deliberate. But we need, in fact, a global voice because we don't have a global voice. And this global voice is not really to undo or to silence all the uh, diversity of, of, of voices that are throughout Africa, throughout Asia, throughout Europe, and throughout Latin America. So I think that we have to, from now on, to be working with this plurality of struggles and learn from each other. Because the only way I can overcome uh, the trauma, quite frankly, as, as Eva was saying, is that we feel that we are not alone. So that someone is out there discussing with us. So that's why I think we should have at the World Social Forum more communication so that people know how many people in the World Social Forum now know what Rojava is. It is really remarkable. They probably they know a bit more about the Zapatistas. But, you know, I can tell you about thousands of other initiatives, what the indigenous people in, in the Cauca region, the ones that created the Minga, I've been with, working with them in Cauca and Cali. I mean, um, the richness of that movement. That's why I'm working with the Constitutional Court to bring the idea of the plurinational state, because they are the ones that they are being assassinated every day. So they are in the front line, like the health services. They are in the front line because they are being killed. How can we do that when we have a narco state like Colombia this, uh, and the necropolitics like global capitalism? So my, my, my salute to all of us is that uh, we have to work at all scales, the local scale, the national scale, and the global scale. We cannot really, and of course, someone, that's a very important discussion that we don't have in our movements, Ashish, and with that I conclude, is that we don't know how to distinguish between important struggles and urgent struggles. Important struggles are all the struggles because that go against capitalism, colonialism, and patriarchy. But in a given country, at a given moment, some struggles may be more, more urgent than others. So let's move from there. And if we do this, then we can expand our concept of democracy. And uh, Arturo was saying about the, the and, and Evo, about the nature and so on. Well, we are moving in that direction. We have already rights of nature. We still, there, we still don't have democracy of nature, but we are getting there. And I think the ecology, the deep ecology is leading in that direction. That's where I am. So I think that we have to be very humble, open to this diversity, but at the same time, pay attention, domination is global upon us and is right here. I mean, because we know that our data are being collected by them at this very moment. So Thanks, we are not outside. For... Okay, thank you. <laughs> yeah, sorry. Uh... Thanks, thanks, uh, Bo. I think uh, you know this this distinction you just made between important struggles and urgent struggles. This is so very uh, crucial. I mean, and it's there even within a sector right now. We have the farmers' movement going on in India, and the the urgency is the repeal of the three laws, which is further commercialization, commercializing, and commodifying agriculture. But there's a much, there's a equally important longer term struggle of redoing agriculture itself in terms of sustainability and uh, equality and so on. Um, all right, so Arturo, um, I had a whole bunch of issues for you, but uh, I think just going a little bit further on this whole issue of decolonizing democracy, and you mentioned earlier sort of pluriversal ways of looking at democracy. So how do you think we can think of like multiple forms of not democracy as one homogeneous way of looking at it across the earth with elections and blah, 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 but sort of multiple different ways of democracy in which, in fact, truly it is power of the people, which is the original meaning of the word. 
and and how do you think sort of what would be the ways of trying to bring some of these together Arturo. okay thanks ashish thanks everybody for the wonderful contributions and and, and answers and questions on the chat as well <clears throat> and to get to your question ashish i will make a difference between but I will talk about two, what I think are two open questions in both activist practice and in social theory. And I'll mention them in a moment, but I wanted to start first by uh, bringing into the foreground something that Ruth mentioned, which is the perspective of the wretched of the earth, the damne, the famous uh, and very important concept from Frantz Fanon, and Eva also mentioned that concept. And remembering this wonderful work by the Jamaican philosopher, Sylvia Winter, uh, that um, coined this concept that she says that we are trapped within a mono-humanist notion of the human, a mono-humanist notion of the human, Western bourgeois, liberal, secular, rational, and so forth. And that it has basically expanded and colonized all other ways of thinking and being human today. But also she said that if we really want to begin a process of emancipation from that notion of the human, we have to build on the perspective of the damne, the, the, the colonized, the, uh, the region of the earth. So in a way, uh, this is to me, the, the highest stake of all is how do we learn how to live differently? And I think uh, the compañera from Rojava mentioned that as well, is it the struggle is, is part of the struggle against capitalism and patriarchy and so forth is how do we live otherwise how do we liberate ourselves from the straight jacket of this particular way of being human that she traces sylvia winter traces very well historically and politically so the two open questions for me are the first one is and especially once we know that the liberal th theory answer to these questions is no longer working, and the Marxist answer to these questions is insufficient, then how do we answer these questions? And the first one is, what is social change? What is systemic change? What is social transformation? What is radical systemic change? And, uh, and the second one is, what are radical alternatives that can help us along the that path towards that transformation that we envision and we want? And uh, so how do we bring about social change through these radical alternatives? And I'll talk a little bit about both of them. So um, these two strategies, I think that are very important that I see as emerging from below, especially answers from both activist practice to some extent also in connection with academic theory. The first one is the strengthening of local autonomy. And this has come up very clearly to me in the answers and conversation here today. And the strengthening of local autonomy has to do with at least four other processes. The first one is the recommunalization of social life. Anywhere we are, we have to contribute to reconstitute a certain sense of a communal way of being because globalization has been the destruction and the war against everything collective and everything communal. The second one is the relocalization of social activities like food, very, very important food. Paulo mentioned agroecology, that's a very important dimension of it, the relocalization of cultural activities, political activities, local democracy, grassroots democracy, and so forth. The third one is that, and this comes from Latin American feminists very clearly, is the depetricalization and de-racialization of social relations. It has to be done simultaneously. We need to build non-patriarchal and non-racist ways of being. And the last one, uh, the, uh, the fourth axis, for strengthening local autonomy is the, uh, the reintegration with the earth in some fashion, and that can be spelled out, obviously. Now, to answer these questions, it cannot be done only theoretically, and, and I think Kali mentioned this when he says, we cannot just think our way through these questions through theory, it has to be engaged within the practice. So what we see in the practice emerging from many social movements and collectives, is grappling with these different issues and these different access to transformation. And the last thing that I will mention, and this gets to some of the points also that Bo was making about the global dimension of this system of domination, is that if we need 
local strategies for building and strengthening, strengthening local autonomies. We also need strategies of interweaving among radical alternatives. And I have learned quite a bit along the way from the GTA, from many of the work that many of you have been doing, from people's assemblies, for instance, it is about how struggles can connect with each other and build mutually enriching, uh, even with, with from critical perspective, but mutually enriching networks and self-organizing networks of networks uh, that really have a possibility and the potential to make a dent on this very strong systems domination that we are facing. And maybe the final thing that I will say is that that then in thinking about the confluences and the convergences, uh, and they, for me, there emerges this different level, I, I don't know how to call it, but call it the meso level, the meso level of thinking about strategies for the connection among alternatives, regional levels, which can be also transnationally uh, conceived. Uh, for instance, now we're trying to build processes by the convergences between uh, radical alternatives in Colombia and in Mexico through the concept of crianza mutua, the mutual co-emergence or co-nurturing of radical alternatives from below. And I think that's a level to which it, it makes sense to start paying attention today. So thank you, Ashish, again. Thank you, Arturo. Uh, that's been quite an amazing range of things that the panel has brought out. I wish we had many more hours to go into some of these things even deeper and wider. But we have a, a, a already many questions uh, that have emerged in the chat box and uh, Shrishti is uh, helping me with tracking them. Uh, I'm gonna put the questions, I will try and see if I can address them to particular panelists, but that may not always be possible. So any of the panelists can please feel free to jump in. The first one is uh, is about how do you how would you describe the key the key principles for radical or off radical education? How can education escape the reproductive nature of liberal democracies and allow radical democratic imaginaries? Uh, Pedro and I think uh, Ruth kind of partly already referred to this. Does either of you want to say anything further for this question? Ruth or Pedro? Uh, okay, um, it seems like I'm going to go. Okay, so um, I'm going to answer that question with, um, you know, um, I mean, of course, going beyond, I mean, not going beyond, but like, the work that we do, of course, is grounded um, in uh, Freire's work on pedagogies of the oppressed, but also is grounded in, you know, centuries old, um, you know, in ways of indigenous ways of knowing and cosmologies of uh, African women on this continent and feminists on this continent. And I think for us, uh, when we think about political dedication um, and how it moves away from sort of the banking model, and you know the depoliticized models that we have um, in very many places, not just in the formal education system, but also in so many so-called radical organizing spaces. And for us, it has always come back to what are our visions of liberation. The ways in which we have thought of what political education means to us has started from the framework of what do we envision liberation as? You know, what is our, you know, what is the political project? of our organizing work as feminists working on ecology in the country, I mean, on the, on the continent. You know, the second question for us has always been, you know, whose aspirations do we want to center in our organizing work? So for us, political education isn't simply about this grand theoretical or co grand conversations that we have, but it is basically one of the key tools of resourcing for the kind of radical work that we need. And of course, um, to again, mention what Kali has said, and I think uh, Boa or Arturo has, um, you know, spoken back on that. Eu queria, eu, eu queria falar sobre... Eu penso... Yes, Pedro, we will get to you. Uh, let, let Ruth finish, please. 
Okay. Ah, uh, all right. Okay. So it hasn't, it's not just about this grand theoretical thing that we are doing, right? We are resourcing for the kind of movement and organizing work we already do. Whether it's, you know, um, women seed savers in Kenya, who despite the fact that we have legislation that criminalizes or uh, criminalizes, um, you know, using of non, you know, non-certified seeds, them defying the order. And of course, you know, passing down their knowledge uh, from, you know, intergenerational knowledge around seed saving. So it's basically, what is our political project? That is the first way to think about how we structure radical uh, political education. It starts from that. And then it's, it goes to whose aspirations are we centering? Again, going back to we are centering the aspirations of the wretched of the earth. We are centering the, centering the aspirations you know, of the most marginalized, those on the front lines of multiple and intersecting crises. So we start from there. And that's how we begin to think about what whether it's a radical curriculum that we have. Um, so that is how we think about uh, uh, the possibilities of political education being radical and not just this chain system or capacity building system that many of us often find ourselves in when we are sort of working on um, whether, you know, but when we're working on ecological politics, working on any radical thing. Thanks, Ruth. Uh, but that kind of radical education would also, of course, have to be oriented at changing mindsets in the ones who are not the marginalized, right? I mean, the ones who are dominating. So we need it, I guess, across the thing. But what you're saying is the, the concerns and the knowledge systems of those who are marginalized need to be at the center of that. Pedro, you wanted to add something on this. Pedro? Uh, is Pedro, are you having a difficult? Okay, you, are on now. you can talk. Yes, Sim, agora. Yes. Uh, eu penso que uma educação radical para uma democracia radical, ela tem que envolver três três princípios, né? Três princípios básicos. Ela deve ser uma educação para a decisão, para a deliberação. É, não existe democracia radical é, em que as pessoas não são chamadas a decidir. Segundo, ela deve ser uma educação para promover a, a autonomia e a emancipação individual e coletiva das pessoas. E terceiro, ela deve ser uma educação no sentido de é, promover a, o desenvolvimento da compreensão dos comuns, no sentido daquilo que é comum. Então, é, eu penso que esses são três princípios funda fundamentais. A, a metodologia né, é, ela deve estar fundada naquilo que... Paulo Freire chama de uma educação dialógica. Né? E essa educação dialógica é aquela educação que se desenvolve né, a partir do reconhecimento né, da, da, da multiplicidade de saberes, né, ou que Boa Ventura chama de ecologia de saberes, né, que devem ser está presentes na prática, né? na prática educativa. Né? E, 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 essa, e, e essa educação radical, né? ela, ela deve produzir, portanto, né? é uma transformação dessas estruturas. E, ela só tem sentido na medida em que ela promove efetivamente uma transformação dessas estruturas, né? uma ampliação dos espaços de representação, uma democratização radical né? 
das estruturas de representação. Então, penso que essa tem sido assim a, a compreensão da gente do que seria uma educação uh, para uma democracia radical. Gracias, uh, Pedro. Thank you. Um, we have a question which I would have liked to ask uh, Kali, but I think he's temporarily had to step out uh, to take his kids to school. Uh, but, but there's a question for Arturo, which is connected. So maybe, Arturo, you could deal with both of them together. Um, so the first one is, should radical activism be more aggressive in its discourse, denouncing and trying to dismantle publicly the lies and false promises of the fascist capitalist power uh, to give grassroots activists a powerful message under which we can see ourselves building other worlds. And connected to this is um, how do we connect such struggles, our struggles, in a way uh, while ensuring that that connectedness strengthens the community's capacity for self-determination rather than undermines it, uh, and certainly rather than absorbing them into some new form of uh, capitalist or state system. Arthur, are those Arthur, are those two clear? Yes, I think they are okay. Uh, brief yeah. answer for now. Um, I think there is a plenty of radical activism that is aggressive today, certainly in the global south. Uh, both Pedro and Boaventura have mm -hmm. mentioned the Minga, this wonderful movement from indigenous movement from Southwest Colombia that has this project of the liberation of modern earth. And it's a very sophisticated politically and theoretically a movement. And it's, it's very explicitly anti-capitalist, non-statist, anti-patriarchal, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And at the same time, I think it's very important, and I think this is something that is emerging with greater clarity in many of these circles. Uh, I think Kali mentioned it and Eva mentioned it, maybe some others mentioned it, on having a politics without enemies. And the politics without enemies, uh, because if the understanding of life that we want to convey is an understanding that life is interdependence and interconnectedness and relation from the get-go and all the way down from the beginning of life to today is all about radical interdependence. Ubuntu, I exist because you exist, I exist because everything else exists, then enemies are part of that weave of interdependence that we have to heal and care for. That doesn't mean that anything goes. That doesn't mean leaving them off the hook. That doesn't mean not speaking truth to power. All of those things have to be done, but also without building a politics that is just anti this and anti that and anti that, but also a more prescriptive, more, uh, how, how is, what is the word? Uh, that, that makes more positive kind of politics. Okay. And in terms of the, yeah, this is the, the sort of the, the dance between autonomy and heteronomy, I guess, between strengthening its local autonomy without aiming for any degree of closure or pure purity or any of that, but always open because reality is open, reality is pretty versa. I mean, uh, but what I see in, in communities that have been in autonomy, autonomy is a preparation for weaving, interweaving with other struggles with other communities, with other people, but under more symmetrical conditions, without a certain degree of autonomy, no strategy of relocalization or recommunalization has any success for, for any, any chance to succeed. Uh, so autonomy is very important in order to then begin to weave with other struggles and so forth. Okay, that's what comes to mind sort of in a short way. Thank you, Arturo. It also brings to mind uh, the Indian uh, notion of Swaraj, which you are a little bit familiar with, which is really about autonomy, individual and collective autonomy, but in responsibility to your autonomy and your, uh, your freedoms. And one can extend the your to not just other human beings, but also other species. Uh, and so building that sense of responsibility and restraint 
as a preparation for building the larger networks and sort of global movements, I think would be very important. And also something what uh, I think Eva and others were talking about looking inside and, and building a, a more humanized uh, discourse. Okay, uh, I have, there's a question now on, uh, which is kind of partly already answered by, uh, by Boa and uh, others, which is about the role of the state, but also the role of international or <coughs> Uh, multilateral agencies like the United Nations. Uh, given that I think uh, Boa has already mentioned that we need to work at all these levels, there is sort of legitimate action at all of these levels. Maybe I can actually ask uh, uh, Sherveen what she thinks is the possible role. Is there a role? And if so, what is the possible role of, let's say, the, the United Nations framework, the United Nations frameworks on human rights and others? Um, has that been of help in their struggles, in your struggles, Sherwin? Well, at first you have to be recognized as a nation or as a state in order to have a voice at the United Nations. And uh, for the Kurds, uh, this hasn't been the fact. Uh, so uh, the, solving the crisis in Syria, um, so far no legitimate representative of the autonomous uh, region in uh, north and eastern Syria, which is about uh, a third of the population of Syria, is not represented there. And those that are invited to these official platforms are um, those um, jihadist forces uh, that have been built up by Turkey and uh, are a part of the war and terror on women and the people here. So uh, they were, are seen uh, as an opposition. Uh, they are invited to these talks, but there's no representation of uh, the people's uh, councils, uh, the whole system of democratic autonomy that has been established. So of course, we will continue also the struggle that uh, this gets at acknowledged, uh, but uh, it's still such a far step uh, and um, I don't know um, if not a pressure international pressure from many many sites uh, in cooperation is done on this uh, mechanism uh, a local struggle itself um, uh, that is not uh, according to the interest of uh, capitalist uh, powers uh, state powers heavy monarch powers colonial powers um, won't be able to open these doors um, but I believe that if we can really uh, build up um, a confederal a system of people's um, uh, autonomy worldwide and connect this um, uh, in an effective way so that um, we make uh, the, the system that is not functioning and that is a, a reason for the crisis, ecological crisis, human crisis uh, that we are living in, um, then we can also open maybe these doors, but um, uh, we cannot, uh, like the uh, one of the friends gave the example of the um, elections in, um, in the US. Um, of course, uh, there are different presidents look different and have, uh, uh, and maybe uh, under different presidents, you have different, um, at different limits of uh, which you which you can use uh, for um, developing your struggle to create conscience and so on, but uh, in the core um, it's a state system. And for the Middle East, we still don't know. We don't uh, can give hope uh, on uh, that with uh, an, a new president in the United States, the problems will, will be solved um, if we. Um, uh, don't um, um, rely on on our own strength and uh, on our own uh, uh, strength of uh, uh, building up uh, and finding solutions for for the problems that society faces, and we don't have the strength of self defense. Then um, it it won't be. We cannot. We cannot uh, give this. Uh, uh, trust or um, anything in, in the international mechanisms uh, so far we, we, we because we always have uh, made the same experiences again and again. So I don't know until really an international struggle for the um, acknowledgement, uh, official acknowledgement of the uh, democratic uh, autonomy self-administration in this region uh, 
is not uh, carried out, um, it, it looks very hard. Thank you. So, I, I mean, obviously, there are limits to the, the UN because it is based on a nation state uh, model. Uh, but there are different realities. I guess there are parts of the world where uh, for things like the human rights instrument uh, would have been useful for the local struggles. Um, so like I think Bo or somebody said there are different realities and different levels. Um, okay, there's a kind of related question which is about global philanthropy. Um, what would be the appropriate way in which global philanthropy could support transnational organizing of movements, which all of you have spoken about? in a way that doesn't make it an NGOization, which has unfortunately happened to a lot of the transnational or global processes. Uh, who would like to take that on? I, I, um, I'm, Eva, not, I'm not particularly uh, um, familiar with the experience of receiving philanthropy. So I didn't have a huge amount to say, but I was thinking about it uh, recently. Um, I think that uh, any uh, people with access to large amounts of wealth who want to support um, these kinds of initiatives would need to give their money completely without strings. Um, and, and if they uh, uh, were to attend would need to attend as an individual rather than as a representative of the, the holders of that money. Um, because I think that we're all too familiar with the way that um, funds can drive um, mission rather than the other way around. Um, and, I, and I think it, it uh, that uh, necessity for people to attend democratic processes at their, as themselves rather than as representatives or in or in role um, really extends beyond just just funders for me it's it's quite crucial um, that uh, I think that when so certainly within my culture yeah I'm sure about within others but within within um, the UK culture when people are in role they they actually are not being fully human <laughs> they're, they're being part of a hierarchy uh, and there are certain things that they're not allowed to think, uh, and there are certain ways that they're not allowed to feel and, and to express empathy and, and what they really think or what they really feel. That's that may be at the cost of their job, so they won't do it. Uh, and I think that's one of the reasons why uh, climate change, the, the, the attempts to deal with climate change is so slow. It's like nobody will speak out. Uh, I've had experiences of people speaking out of role you know, saying they're frightened for their kids' futures, whereas where in role, they, they would never say such a thing. Um, so, yeah, sorry, strayed slightly off the, off the question there, but I think that, that, that uh, yeah, that sense of attending as a human rather than as a representative is really important. Mm. And of course, the big question of how does one democratize the philanthropic institutions themselves? Uh, but that's a subject for another whole uh, webinar, maybe. Boa, you wanted to add, uh, quickly to this point? No, oh, I, I think that we have to be very clear about the, our enemies. That's the point. I mean, we, we have, there was a time in which we are, we were more clear about our enemies. And uh, today we, we are not so clear. I think that for me, global philanthropy is a bad word. I mean, quite frankly, is absolutely detrimental to our objectives. I mean, it's the way of appeasing the, the false consciousness and bad conscious of uh, the, the wealthy of the world. I mean, it's, it's, uh, it's the social responsibility branch of the World Economic Forum, basically. That's what it is now. So I think we should be really, you know, absolutely against the philanthropy is, is the opposite of the commons, is the way that we care about each other, is caring. But for caring means some kind of reciprocity. I mean, I care for you because you care for me. We, we need reciprocal care. Philanthropy is just the opposite. You need me, I don't need you. Uh, unless, you know, to, to cut in my, my, my taxes or to appease my conscience. I don't want to appease the conscience of our enemies. They are, I think that we are at a time and if, if, we, if, if we do not really be a bit more aggressive and create fear, to the global powers, they are not fearful. 
of us. I mean, they are listening to our to our discussions here and they are laughing. I mean, these are crazy guys that are deciding, but they are using us. We can just turn them off and they are gone because, you know, if they can't use the Zoom, what, what can you do? So the arrogance of these people is tremendous, Ashish. So I think that we have really to create from bottom up. This what we were discussing the islands of uh, liberated zones, the, the islands of these different global tapestries as you are building and we are in different ways. The idea is that to move from the islands to the archipelago. I mean, we need that to the, our islands are in an archipelago. Yeah, could the World Social Forum be an archipelago? Could your global tapestry organization be an archipelago? Yeah, that's it could, but we need a new mental geography, and we have to do that, uh, you know, very autonomously in this way. And I see the NGOs, uh, you know, did a lot of damage to the World Social Forum in the last twenty years, and um, they are still doing that. Uh, so they are infiltrated inside the World Social Forum, virtual social forum. So. Yeah, let's let's be more clear about that. We 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 are so nice people that we really don't <laughs> like to say some nasty words against some people that are doing much damage. You know, look at vaccine and the, the Bill Gates Foundation and the vaccines. What the big pharma are doing? I mean, this is absolutely scandalous. It's a crime that they are committing before our eyes. And this virtual forum is going to do nothing or say nothing about the next crime, big pharma crime, corporate crime, will be the vaccination of the world. We should do away with patents, of course. But see, they are not ready to accept that. And I don't see many people doing this at this point. So I say, let's really be more aggressive in our <laughs> actions and in our deeds, in a sense. <laughs> Down with the global <laughs> philanthropy. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks. Okay. That's uh, very straight. Uh, put very straight and and uh, frankly, uh, and I I tend to agree with you. Um, one of the questions, and I think this relates also to everything people have been saying, is we haven't really spoken about youth and youth power. Um, and unfortunately, there's nobody really that young in the panel. Uh, okay, some of you are. Sorry, I haven't guessed anybody's ages, but um, maybe Sherwin is probably the youngest or Eva might be. Um, but anyway, the question uh, is, uh, how do your movements engage the youth, 14 to 20, and this is really young people, um, do they do, and if so, how? So uh, we don't have the time for all of you to answer this, but uh, who wants to take it? Uh, maybe, I mean, I would personally be interested in seeing how does it work, say, for instance, in in the African context or in the Kurdish context? Um, I can very briefly. Um, I think one of the things that I didn't talk about in terms of the pillars of political education for the collective that I'm part of is one of the strong pillars is uh, cultures of the liberation or liberation cultures, which borrows from uh, Amil Kaka Brow's revolutionary work around using uh, culture, um, you know, as a point of reference, but also as a revolutionary strategy and tactic. So one of the things that has been very key for us is using film and art and, and graffiti, you know, in terms of as a space to, you know, conscientize and uh, use it as a form of, you know, space for uh, radical and political education. I mean, one of the things that's very often very strange is that we see art and culture sort of relegated to the very end, musicians, uh, artists, uh, you know, sort of like, or, you know, um, poetry, things like poetry, sort of are sort of used at the, they come at the very end, we talk serious stuff. And then at the very end, once we finished our very serious conversation, that's when we invite the artists to come and entertain us. It's, it's very often and very unfortunate that we don't think about art, you know, as a form of liberatory tool in very radical ways, you know? And I'm saying this as someone who is, you know, and I see the radical work. I mean, we've seen, we saw it in Argentina and in Chile, the use of music, for example. We've seen it in, you know, the South African revolution. One of the things we say, on the continent of Africa is that one thing that South Africans will always do is that they will always sing, that their liberation always has 
music. So I would say that our use of art, music, film, poetry, literature has been such an incredible you know, entry point for young people, you know, to feel part of a space, but also to explore their creativity, right? And also to locate art and liberation uh, and liberation culture as also as a process of commoning, you know, because music, because art, because film, you know, these are also spaces of commoning, but they're also spaces of rejecting uh, privatization. I mean, and I come from a continent with very long history when you look at liberation movements, uh, not, not just Hamilcar Cabral, but you look at even Africa's music. This is music that was supported by, used to be supported by the state, for example, has a long history of being, uh, you know, supported by the state, but also supported, um, you know, by ordinary people, you know. So I think that is an important entry point that we need to think about cultures of liberation and cultures of the revolution, not just as those nice things that we used to entertain ourselves with after we have these serious discussions, but actually as part and parcel. Um, yeah, and I think it has been very incredible for us to see how young people have responded to being introduced to, um, you know, uh, histories of the continent through music, you know, reading various scholars, you know, through graffiti. This has become very, very important because it's something that they co-create, you know, and we sort of leave that space where I am the knowledge keeper and I'm the one transmitting the information. But with art and culture and music and film, you know, you get a collective of people co-creating something together, which of course begins to ingrain the principles of, of the commons rather than, you know, uh, these heroes who liberate uh, people. Thanks, uh, Ruth. Quickly, uh, Sherwin, on, on the role of uh, young people in your movement and we have to finish in about six or seven minutes so i might ask one more final question and then we'll start winding up um, sherin and maybe you can combine that with any final thoughts you have <laughs> okay so the youth movement is also organized autonomously and they have also built up their own communes and uh, councils organizing in sports, arts, culture, uh, some of the examples that also uh, Ruth has uh, given. Um, and inside the young uh, or youth movement, also the young women's movement organizes autonomously. At the same time, they are sending their representatives in all the different fields uh, of the democratic uh, self-administration. So in each of the different commission, commissions uh, from health to education, defense, uh, you have also representatives of the youth uh, councils or the uh, youth movement uh, in it. Uh, so. Uh, on one hand, they can um, build up their, uh, have their own discussion processes and can at the same time also share it uh, in the general uh, assemblies. Um, also for the works of genealogy, there are many young members participating uh, in it. And genealogy also has become a part of the high school education uh, in the uh, education system, uh, school uh, education system that is based on uh, mother tongue or native uh, language um, um, and so it's also for the young uh, generation um, a way of um, uh, learn a different way of how to perceive family uh, of gender relations uh, so these basic questions are also a part of this uh, discussion uh, that are to discussed together with the youth because also like we have in many uh, countries um, special warfare like tra drug trafficking um, trying to enforce uh, prostitutions and things like this are also used um, by different forces uh, uh, to pressure the society to divide and destroy the, the, the society and especially targeting uh, young people and especially also young women. So also to um, create a conscience of uh, self-defense uh, against these kinds of uh, special warfare uh, um, is an important part of the works. For the last um, remarks, um, I just wanted to say this. Um, often uh, some of the other speakers use uh, the term liberated zones. Uh, I think uh, that's quite dangerous if we look at them as zones. 
because then it's something that is separated from the rest of the world. And what we need is our strong connections uh, because the ruling system tries uh, to isolate us, to separate us uh, from each other, closing borders uh, um, and not giving possibilities uh, to, to connect uh, with one another. I think the, we saw uh, in spite of the uh, borders that have, and even the walls uh, that have been now built up uh, on uh, in the borders uh, dividing uh, the Kurdish uh, territory, um, the common ideas and the sense of struggle, the spirit uh, has not been, couldn't be divided. And um, I think that examples in some parts of the world where um, a, a level of self, people's self-administration and uh, self-empowerment, uh, alternative uh, ways of uh, economy uh, been established, they are an inspiration uh, for all of us. Uh, and we have learned that we can find solution for many problems uh, if we unite our wisdom and spirituality, our analytic and emotional intelligence, uh, if we unite uh, our political thought, thoughts and statements with the way how we live. Uh, and uh, when we see transform, uh, or when we transform our needs and hopes uh, into communal organizing and actions. And this is a process that needs to uh, go on uh, like from re local to regional to um, uh, global levels. Um, and I think that in a time of deep despair, uh, human and ecological crisis, um, the examples that we have in different parts uh, of the world uh, um, create uh, hope and give new inspirations. For instance, in this uh, discussion also, the, there are so many common points from popular education from two people's assemblies uh, to the need to, to, for a new epistemology. Um, they are common agendas that we have. Um, and so this is really, the, we have points that show us uh, another world is possible if we divorce ourselves uh, from uh, patriarchy and state mentality, um, if we organize from the grassroots uh, and connect our struggles with a global vision and also networks and structures, uh, co coordinations, um, which we maybe can call a kind of people's or women's democratic uh, confederalism, uh, which can uh, connect the specific uh, struggles together with a, with a common uh, vision. Um, and in this sense, I think this discussion has also shown us once again how important it is not only to have a vision, but also to connect it with concrete actions and steps. And uh, I mean, 20 years of World Social Forum. Thanks, uh, thanks, Sherwin. I, yeah. Um, uh, small steps towards this vision. Okay, thank you. Uh, we are kind of uh, in closing time. I especially want to respect the time of the interpreters because they must be very tired by now. Um, I'm not necessarily going to ask every one of you to have closing remarks, but does anybody want to have? I think Sherwin's final words have kind of encompassed a lot of what we might want to say, but you have a minute if you want, if any of you wants to add anything from the panel. I'll just say a word. Uh, oh, please. Yes. No, it's just a response, and I, I want to clarify with uh, Serbian about liberated zones. The concept comes, as you know, from uh, the liberal struggles I got from liberation struggles. I got it from Emilcar Cabral, the liberated zones against Portuguese colonialism. Then the Zapatistas also used them. But I'm fully aware of the dangers of all the concepts. I mean, it would be really uh, quite a danger to isolate and to separate. So it's a very good point. I'm going to learn, I'm going to think about that, and I'm, um, I'm ready to revise this concept and at least to contextualize it, because uh, you always to see things from different perspectives, and that's the way we learn. Thank you very much, Erwin, for that point. Thank you. As we wind up, uh, one of the requests has been if any of the panelists are okay with putting their contact details for participants to follow up with you later. I, I noticed that I think Ruth and Boa and Eva have already put. If the others, there's no compulsion. If the others would like to put, maybe some of the participants can follow up, including questions and points that have not been able to be addressed. 
uh, any of the other other panelists or can we wind up i don't want to stop you but uh, Uh, okay. All right. From uh, the way Pedro is looking, I think he wants to, but he's not able to unmute. Okay. Yes, Pedro, go ahead. Sim. Apenas, eh, apenas dizer nesse final eh, que nesse ano nós estamos celebrando os 100 anos do nascimento de Paulo Freire, e acho que vale a pena lembrar é, uma, uma, uma afirmação dele, que tem muito que ver com o nosso debate, em que ele dizia que, se, por um lado, é verdade que a educação, né, ou a educação popular sozinha, não consegue construir a democracia, sem ela, a democracia não se constrói. Então, acho que eu queria deixar essa, essa lembrança de uma afirmação de Paulo Freire é, para, esse, para esse debate final. Obrigado. E eu dizer que aprendi Obrigado. muito, aprendi muito com todos e todas vocês nesse nessa manhã de hoje. Muito obrigado. Thank you. I think uh, that's something that you can see on behalf of all of us. Um, just a couple of quick last points and also to announce uh, something that's coming up on the 30th. Uh, one is I think there have been some comments and we haven't really been able to go into it in any detail, but the links between radical political democracy and radical economic democracy. Uh, already we have, of course, from many of you notions of food sovereignty, local self-reliance, local autonomy. All of you have in one way or the other mentioned it. Uh, also the need for radical redistribution of wealth, uh, of, uh, of reimagining the and re the private and many other things, including the recognition of the enormous economic contribution of women and young people and elderly. Uh, in the care and share economy, which never gets calculated in the normal so-called GDP growth calculation. So there's a lot on that relationship between the political and economic that needs to be teased out much more. There were also comments on why did the social movements not manage to stay together as part of the World Social Forum or platforms beyond the World Social Forum. And I think that's something that's going to be addressed hopefully in the global assemblies that are coming together on the 30th. There are a series of global assemblies where many movements will come together, including, I guess, discussions on the future of the World Social Forum, building towards the 2022, uh, hopefully physical World Social Forum, but also other processes interim and beyond the World Social Forum. Um, I think Shishti will put uh, for you uh, links to two of the global assemblies that we are uh, helping to organize along with the other six uh, with all of the seven global processes that she mentioned right in the beginning. Um, I wish we had much more time of course but then staring at a screen is also for such a long time is also not just not such a great idea. Um, so I, this has been at least for me and I think for a lot of us an incredibly stimulating discussion uh, my mind is a bit like, a, you know, we have this festival of Diwali in, in India, which is lights and, and crackers all over the place. So that's what my mind is feeling like right now. It's, it's bursting in many different good ways. Um, I hope we can, in different form, forums and platforms, continue some of this discussion. This is also about building relations uh, around, the, around the world for movements of different kinds. And uh, I'm very, very happy to have been able to uh, moderate this discussion. I'd like to end by thanking a number of people, the seven global processes that put this together, all the seven panelists, the interpreters, a big hand to all the translators. They've done uh, an ama amazing job for two and a half hours. It's not easy to, um, especially to follow people like Ruth and me who speak very fast. 
uh, but it's that's been amazing and including uh, impromptu interpretation from Malcolm Cox for uh, for Sherwin in the chat box uh, and the global tapestry another team that has put this session together um, Rosie many thanks for also coordinating all the tech stuff that you helped us with so just gracias obrigados thank you and for everybody we will put up the recording uh, there's also four live streams so i think recordings are happening in french spanish and english and portuguese so we will have it available in four languages rosie is that correct anyway i think that's the that's the message i got so hopefully we'll have recordings in four languages Okay. Bye bye. Bye. Take care from there.